thanks for this uh, opportunity. You know, what I'm going to do in this session is, because I realize that uh, we cannot take off uh, from this position unless we have a clear formal picture. Because those assumptions may be clear to us, but may not be clear to many. So it would be a kind of uh, confusing uh, meandering into the subject. And therefore, there is a need to look at the core assumptions in the in the form formulation of critical criminal law or in formulating critical criminal uh, critical perspectives in criminal law. So what I am going to do that I I have tried to bring all these scattered ideas in at one place to be able to communicate to you in that in next 20 minutes very clearly as to what are the proposed assumptions and then you can interact on those assumptions. So I am trying to create this body in the beginning. I am saying that it is a very formal kind of presentation. It is not a general expression I am making. So therefore, I would be using certain terminology as well as I would be using certain theoretical premises which have been developed in all places and then probably subsequently we would be in a position to scrutinize the Indian stand or the Indian realities or the Indian realities on criminal law on that uh, thing. Because if you see that this helplessness towards criminal law is visible even in Western scholarship. And I can quote a straightway Ellen, who is another book which he has written on punishment, responsibility, and justice. He said, a sufficiently just and analytically coherent system of criminal law is an unrealistic aspiration. Now, this is something. I, I present no, uh, no less said because he was speaking in the context of UK and the contemporary reform that UK society wanted and because UK has done a lot in terms of reform and all that. So this helplessness of the scholars towards criminal law that he said ultimately a just and uh, a coherent system of knowledge cannot be created as far as criminal law is concerned. Now this is a critical thinking which he was trying to develop and therefore I said, even at all other places, he was more and more focused on contradictory aspect. He said, criminal law cannot be a historical. The first paragraph of his other book, he is quoting William Howard, uh, you know, Howards. He said, in average classroom, he is talking about UK and all places. He is in average classroom. The teacher would go and try to rationalize criminal law. Now, he, he was up against this rationalizing principle. He said criminal law cannot be a rationalizing entrepreneurship. And he said criminal law has to be accepted with all its contradictions. And therefore, he said a historical criminal law cannot be possible because the rationalizing enterprise is, uh, you know, exposed by this historical continuity. So he said, the principles of criminal law are historic and relative rather than natural and general. This was a very interesting statement which he had made. Now, to contextualize all this thing, as I said, I am starting a small presentation with uh, certain ideas which I am giving. And if you need not to worry about much about it, we can discuss these things. See, first is that, that criminal law looks at criminal law as a theoretical, functional and historic critique by applying philosophical uh, you know, So first we have to understand the historic context, functional context. Paul Robinson was a functionalist. He said it is the function of criminal law ultimately which is important. So notion of critical criminal law can be extended to the contours of normative, historical, institutional and social. So what I am saying is we have to locate the critique in criminal law we have to take one of these dimensions. So sometimes you can approach the criticality from the viewpoint of normative, as Professor Pandey is saying. Normative discourses we are going to undertake in subsequent session, where we are questioning the normative criminal law as such, the intention of the criminal law, the, op the operation of criminal law. And we can also look at the historical analysis. Historical, Norway was a historian. He said criminal law has to be found and located in historical continuity. He said it has evolved over a period of time, therefore you cannot, you know, uh, remove it from that context. And institutional analysis. 
What are the institutions of criminal law? We always talk about criminal law as a black letter law, but the institutions of criminal law are very important, where police, prosecution, judges, court. So critique is also located when you are, Professor Pandey just mentioned about police. So if we have to look at the function of the police within the framework of criminal law, and we have to offer a institutional critique, means we are looking at the police. Another thing is the law in action. So we are talking about the drawing of the law and reality of the law. So most of critical criminal law's engagement is into the reality of criminal law rather than the rhetoric of the criminal law. So when we move to look at the operation of criminal law, how people interact. Because you see, you just look at our knowledge and conditioning about the criminal law subject. We think criminal law is a kind of unilateral, one dimension thing. It is not an interactive reality. I have just mentioned a word in my previous remarks in the beginning. I said criminal law is a communication. Now this is a very important term. It interacts. So if you do a discourse analysis of criminal law, how it interacts with the people. And that's why I mentioned a very nice book by you know, Wade Mansell. Wade Mansell, A Critical Introduction to Law. It's a beautiful small book. And the first chapter of this book is devoted. I am just looked, focusing on point number three. She said, the common sense of law is very important. The common sense of law is getting eclipsed in the whirlwind of all what we try to say. So as long as the law continues to be closer to the common sense of the people, the law becomes more and more acceptable and more and more useful to the people. And therefore, I say that the reality and rhetoric of the law is very important. Next is, when we look at the legitimacy of the criminal law, how it is accepted, because we say criminal law is a public law. Why it is public law? It concerns with private harm caused to the people. So where is the dimension of, uh, you know, uh, social dimension? But as we now gather that criminal law is increasingly becoming the state law rather than individual's law. And, and you, there is a critique also on this point that much of criminal law has, the, the, in much of criminal law, the individual has been removed. That's why you say individual is not into it. Stakeholders are removed. It is only the institutions who have taken over the criminal law, whether it is police or prosecutor. So sometimes the people, uh, I'll come to that point, the criminal law has stolen the conflicts from the people. It has stolen the conflict. It is our conflict. Two people are in, in, in a situation of harm. A third external system came, which is called criminal. This is a major critique. It has a capacity to steal even your conflicts. You know? So therefore, the individual has been removed from the scene, and it has become more and more states criminal law. Therefore, law in context and normative law debate is happening. Uh, some explanation about the justification and limit of criminal law. So when we are exploring the critical perspectives in criminal law, we are not only talking about the normative boundaries of criminal law, we are also looking at the criminalization, investigation, adjudication, sentencing, and punishment. So all critical perspectives have to be located within the these sub-parameters. And limit is very important. What are the limits of the application of criminal law? Now let us look at the emerging scholarship which is happening. Uh, to the extent that in its theoretical context, the basic idea when CLS started, Critical Legal Studies Movement, you please read David Carey's famous book uh, on law as politics. Law is politics, so three chapters are devoted to criminal law in this book. And she has formulated this idea that much of the operation of criminal law is nothing but politics, because criminal law tend to represent the dominant interest in its operation. That is what Richard Queeney also you know, mentioned. Uh, <coughs> it believed that law exists to support the interest of the party or class that it forms, and merely a collection of beliefs and prejudices that legitimize the injustices of the society. Now, this is very important. And second approach is functionality. 
So functionality criticized the system and institution associated with criminal law. So if you look at the uh, writings of Robinson and Mark Dover, you know, Mark Dover has written a beautiful article about the Americans' war on crime. You know, the war on crime was a very famous slogan when criminal law was made so tough. You know, the so war on crime was waged. But he titled his paper, War on Crime and End of Criminal Law. End of Criminal Law. He said, War, of, war on Crime may provide you a temporary success, but it amounts to the end of criminal law. So this is also quite synonymous to what Herbert Packer says in its uh, crime control and due process model. So you look at these perspectives. There is also discussion about the judge's personal discretion and how the judges in judiciary and so many disparities which are arising out of the operation of the criminal law. And very important part is, last part especially with respect to criminal procedure, you can look at the criminal law has become a tool of preventive regulation. Because much of criminal law is preventive. You are giving a warning, you know, before your conduct takes place that this, you will be punished like this and this. So preventive criminal law has a tendency to punish the people more and more. So we have adopted a very preventive model of criminal law, which is giving a kind of uh, arbitrary discretion to the police in investigation of these cases. What I am trying to say, the nature of criminal law, the way the criminal law is conceptualized becomes something very important. So how the criminal law has been historically conceptualized, it is giving all these you know, uh, manifestations. So Ellen Norrie also analyzed the roots of criminal law, which is imperative to locate the inherent, irrational, and unjustified structural aspects of criminal law. Now, it is a very serious critique if I say that criminal law also is structural in nature. Structural means, I don't know uh, to what extent it is true, but the application of law also creates certain hierarchy. It is not only applied in a hierarchical manner, it also creates certain hierarchy. So those who are applying the law, those who are selectively being applied the law, those who are selectively applying the law, all these things tend to create categories within the society. So when you see in America the blacks are more and more in prisons, or if you see in India the people from weaker sections are more and more into Paul Butler in the morning, I said, he is raising this question, How? what is this kind of operation of criminal law which is sending the underprivileged people more and more behind the bars? It cannot be a random thing. So I don't know, it is a selective enforcement of criminal law in a particular way. How a criminal, an objective criminal law in its operation can afford to create hierarchies and classes? So the structural criminal law, the notion of the structural criminal law is something which is also very, very critical. And it generates historical forms of social control, particular to it. And this historical analysis basically talk about the general principle of law, which are the result of social and political struggles and contradiction. Actually, Norris said this that criminal law can be cannot be detached from the social, political struggles and contradictions in a given society. And therefore, the kind of society we have, I am telling you, when Norris finds himself so helpless in a country like India, which is so diverse and so with full of so much stark diversity, it is very difficult to objectively apply the law because there, is, there are resistance and there are acceptance. When it suits to your interest, there is acceptance. When it does not suit to, there is resistance. So even there is a resistance to the application of law. That's why in India, the failure of social legislation is a big issue. Why social legislations are not getting successful? Because we have to revisit this question. In order to understand the irregularities and rationality in criminal law, it becomes imperative to know the social and political scenario of a particular society in a historical context. Normative critique. Now the first is normative critique, where we, look, we explore the limits of criminal law, which includes the menace of over-criminalization and complex principles of criminalization. So how the criminalization is happening, because criminal law has a capacity to stigmatize the people, to blame the people, and it, 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 includes, it includes the criticizing the legal formalism in the criminal process. And therefore, the, the writings of Hussak 
clearly say that criminalization should be adopted as a last resort principle. So there is a famous article by Husar which says that criminal law should be the last resort. Now the last resort principle is becoming the first resort in India. Because in India, we have a very kind of very firm notion that if more and more people are getting arrested, we feel that criminal law is becoming successful. So success of criminal law has been linked with the making of arrest. This is something very, very flawed understanding and notion. And this, this is there. So over criminalization leads to enormous injustice through unjustified punishment. And India is a case of over criminalization. I think serious debate is required. Proportionality is another issue which has to be looked at because in Salman Khan case, in many other cases, we, we debate this whether it, it is a proportionate punishment. But I always say going beyond the journalistic impression and ideas, I say if at all this question is to be debated, what should be the guiding principle? Because we forget that there is enough within the body of criminal law to be guided on this particular idea. Now I am coming to the last portion. The normative theorists seek that how the analytical criminal law and all other things should go. I will straightway come to uh, this question which is linked to the normative critique of criminal law. To whom does criminal law speak? You know, criminal law is a public law. Public law in what sense? If it is not speaking for the people, then whom it is speaking to? This is very important. Normative theorizing about criminal law often starts with the aims of criminal law. What are its proper purposes? But there is a prior question. Who is criminal law for? These are the critical criminal law questions. But there is a prior question. The criminal law aims to govern, to guide, or to control the conduct of a population. So we have given ourselves to be guided by a criminal law in the event of the deviation from the accepted conduct. So whose conduct and whose law? Who will define the order? Wade in her critical introduction to law said, whose order and whose reality? Who defines the order? Your order or my order? There is no objective notion of order as such. What kind of criminal law would citizen of a liberal republic maintain? That is the question. because. Average person is not a party in the conceptualization of criminal law. That is the whole issue. And therefore, criminal law does not create wrongs. Actually, criminal law does not create wrongs. It does not make wrong what was not already wrong by criminalizing it. So criminalization is a process wrong was already there. Rather, it declares certain kinds of pre-existing wrongs to be public wrong. That is the that is the notion. So this is the construction of Republican criminal law. We have to we have to actually analyze. I don't have sufficient time to elaborate these points. But these are the pointers which can take us to a journey of formulating the fundamental assumptions in the theorizing of criminal law. Uh, I am only coming to the uh, last part. The question: How do we know how much censor, how much punishment, deserved punishment? The quantum of punishment is also very, very important discussion. I don't have time to discuss the rationale of punishment. Community shared intuition of justice. Now, so uh, we have just written a very small booklet on restorative justice, perspectives on justice. There we said, whose perspective of justice, by the way, we are talking about? Community's sense of justice, individual sense of justice, victim sense of justice, accused sense of justice. Our police sense of justice, court sense of justice. We have to be very clear about who's justice, by the way. Because court said justice is done. We ask people justice was done. They say we don't know because we don't feel satisfied. But discourse is not happening on these issues. Therefore, I say criminal law is a communication. And it has to be recognized and understood in terms of the discourse it evokes, it triggers. The the last part point is just give me five minutes. 
there are there is a social context also social critique also somebody will speak on that but i have uh, written uh, quoting nore in a society where there is a unequal distribution of wealth and power the principal role of criminal law is to be the buttressing of economic and social dispensation by legitimating state coercion against economically less advantaged persons you know this is his idea of uh, while attributing criminal responsibility again moral credibility and all these debates are very very important i'll come to the feminist leading i am not discussing feminist critique of criminal law is also a very powerful you know opposition so in formulating critical criminal law we are not just critiquing the state we are critiquing it from the perspective of criminal law so if somebody wants to read indian criminal law in a from a feminist angle you will come to understand that female criminality is based on moralistic and social social reasoning rather than legal now this can be a wonderful hypothesis to scrutinize the uh, feministic position uh, and the analysis of the criminal law so ideal womanhood is generally explored in our criminal law what is the ideal real rape you know ideal womanhood so all criminal law tries to standardize the ideal womanhood and then the conceptualization of criminal law happens so even it happens with prisoners if you see the prisoner they reconstruct and retrieve their feminine character that has been lost wo kahenge aapko kya hona chahiye the attention here is paid to reforming the gender based qualities of the women possess very important uh no even uh, even all these people say should we abolish the criminal law <laughs> because if you are not able to maintain even this thought is there in critical criminal law this thinking is there so abolish they say that three aspects of criminal law which they are to make it an utterly unsuitable institution for the kinds of social life and the kinds of relationship we should speak so let us see those three point in i think first is criminal law purposes to declare and enforce authoritative standards of value authoritative standards of value in particular moral value and a particular moral value it claims the authority to tell us how we should live now criminal law would dictate how should we live that's why the the devil and responded and heart and it is started when your privacy criminal law has got a mandate to invade your private spheres criminal law is mandated to do that so whether this mandate is correct and to enforce its demands on us if we disagree or disobey but this critic argue amounts to an illegitimate attempt to impose a moral consensus now this moral consensus is anticipated the criminal law would assume that there there, there is a moral consensus on certain social issues because without that the application of criminal law will not be possible inevitably the consensus of those with political power on societies which are rather characterized by radical moral disagreement it denies to those who do not share that consensus the freedom to think and live second is which i have said sir in the morning criminal law has a tendency to steal conflicts stealing the conflicts because these conflicts belong to the people and people are into conflicts for certain degree of trouble such conflicts and troubles must be resolved any harm that have been done must be repaired but that is a task for those most directly involved for the victim and the offender they should be the prime people in resolving their conflict we need a criminal law which may allow restoration of harm done in a most amicable manner where the parties are the prime actors so here criminal law is even stealing your conflict your own conflicts do not belong to you that is what uh, this uh, this is also a very powerful assumption and last is criminal law deals in punishment it is a pain delivery mechanism it is said that it is a pain delivery apparatus what is needed is instead a process that will repair whatever harm was caused we can save the people involved in conflict and thus restore the relationship restoring the harm done 
of the to the relationship is very important because we have forgotten every crime is injury to the relationship first this definition does not exist in the ipc but primarily this notion is emerging criminal punishment cannot contribute to those appropriate ends it reflects a primitive backward looking concern with retributive justice whereas we should rather be seeking a forward looking restorative or reparative justice so this is emerging in critique of instrumental criminal law what we have acquired is a instrumental criminal law so you commit wrong we will punish you you commit wrong we will punish you it doesn't lead to anywhere because wo keh raha so it is so we have to understand that what is the structure of criminal law and what kind of so these were few propositions which i think can be very very interesting to pursue in order to develop the uh, a cogent uh, body of uh, critical criminal law a lot of scholarship is going on i don't have time to discuss those few points but here i have just tried to give you certain you know parameters certain assumptions which are which are forming the main body of critical criminal law thank you for your attention for uh, giving a overarching view of uh, critical criminal law which covers so many things i would make comment only on one or two things on which uh, professor bajpayee's uh, sociological approach uh, sociologist approach and my legalist approach uh, do not come together professor bajpayee said uh, the wrong was already there Uh, somewhere else, Professor Bajpayee has said there is a conflict between legality and criminality. Uh, that is uh, a sociologist viewpoint appearing, uh, coming in criminal law discourse. I would personally say that uh, even uh, criminality is to be defined by law, as per law. and when we say criminal law then we are talking of a state or a statute or a law which is ordained by a political power the question is uh to what extent we should uh unquestioningly show obedience to this law that is criticalism and to what extent criticalism must go on uh, somewhere on uh, closing an article on constitutional foundations of criminal justice under tension uh, this is uh, the latest article that i wrote i concluded with one small paragraph saying a democratically elected government is fully justified to carve out its own criminal justice policy whether it likes law as a criminal law as a power resource whether it likes criminal law as a normative system professor Bat professor bachbe is using normative in a different sense when i am using normative i am saying normative approach to criminal law normative approach means criminal law is good crime is bad uh, criminal law enforcers are good police is good courts are good punishment is good i'm using it that way and so i'm saying normative approach to criminal law and i'm saying here but how such policy will tie up with the constitutional foundations is a matter to be taken into consideration not only by the elected representatives and the governing elite but also by those who enforce the rule of law the police the prosecution and the constitution the courts etc they are also to be guided by constitutional provisions what will you do you have a function to perform as uh, required by constitution police officer you have a function to perform prosecution 
official function to perform as required by the Constitution. And therefore, I locate in the Constitutional Foundations the first uh, foundation which I say consistency with the fundamental rights. I consider I have not given that attention to Article 13 when I studied the Constitution. But Article 13, 1 and 2 have the key to this constitutional foundation. 13, 1 says all laws which have been adapted under 372 article are subject to consistency with the fundamental right and shall be void if they are inconsistent. And 13, 2 says all future laws whether it is uh, triple talaq law, whether it is any other law that is to be made, it is subject to being not in conflict with fundamental rights. Non-conflict key to all laws. And fundamental rights, therefore, are paramount. Rights of the citizen are paramount. Are some good friends who say that the state has power to impose reasonable restrictions. They can be more than the rights. No, no, reasonable restrictions cannot be. They are only a rider. The rights are paramount. And that is the spirit of Article 13. And that spirit, if it pervades the next line of my next three lines, because viewing criminal justice as a power resource may appear to be exciting and rewarding in the short run. Criminal law as a power resource may appear to be exciting and rewarding in the short run. But to build a enduring and critical system you have to ultimately fall back upon the normative foundations provided by the Constitution and rule of law guarantees. You have to fall back on normative foundations. I am myself not a very great uh, admirer of normative approach, but when I read this, I started thinking, what are the situations in which normative foundations can be done away with. The situations of revolution, genuine revolution, the situations of total change in the society. Till that time, the normative foundations will have their role to play. And that, uh, despite my uh, great admiration for Richard Greenies, a radical alternative to criminal justice of the dominant classes, where Richard Queenie says that radical theory re revises our notions about the related ideas of law and order, natural law, civil liberties, civil disobedience, and morality. In the course of revision, we are developing a new understanding about the role of law in society. And we realize that the ideal of law is a myth that has been perpetrated by a narrow Western intelligence. The same thing has been repeated by, by Horowitz, where he says, a large dominant tradition of Anglo-American legal scholarship today is unhistorical. He says you are perpetrating an unhistorical myth <coughs> to keep this system <coughs> running as a necessity. Don't look to the roots. Don't go. That is what Stephen Box also says. He says, most of us have been fed with this idea. We have been fed with this idea 
medical rape exemption is good, good, good. Because Macaulay Saab had said it in 1835, because that draft penal code had put it there, and everything has been changed in 2013, excepting marital rape exemption. Sapadal diya dohla tera Even after after Nebhaya case, that was remained untouched. That has remained untouched since 1940. The age has remained 15 years, has not been increased to 16 years or 18 years. What is so sacrosanct about it? Because Macaulay Sam Media, our obedience to a tradition of accepting law as it is. So criticalism to the extent of Richard Queenie, that is too much. But criticalism to the extent of critiquing what is wrong, that is permissible. British people, the House of Lords, in 1991, in William v. William case, changed the law. They said, we know it has been given by Hale in 1836. And we have been following this, that uh, marital consent is once consent, always a consent. We overrule it because it is uncivilized now. Unhone consciously isko change kiya. Hum log 2017 mein bhi consciously change nahi kar pa rahe hain. Union government gave an affidavit and union government is known for being Pro women, nari ke saath, humara haath, kya kya, achhi baat hai. That's all wonderful. But when it comes to making real change, we are not able to do it. Because then we take the argument of, the affidavit says that it will be, it will be destabilize the institution of marriage. It will be a tool against husbands. Why the club it is crime is being perpetrated and you are saying it will be true against the husband. Husbands become innocent and wives become culprits and perpetually culprits just because they have got married. No, therefore this this is the this these are the areas in which criticalism <coughs> should blow away the old garbage. But at the same time, normative approach ko bhi totally debunk nahi karna hai. Law is a power, criminal law is a power resource. Aisa nahi karna hai. Rape se hum power prapt karenge. Lynching se hum power prapt karenge. That is despicable. So that, these are the challenges of a person who is doing scholarship in critical criminal law. And these are the real challenges that are thrown up by Indian society. 